Amen. Mm. This morning we're going to take you back to your high school days. Do you remember high school? Do you remember your best friend? Your absolute best friend in the world. What about your secondary friends? And then you had friends that were friends. When's the last time you talked to any of them? Some of you may be last week, last month. Some of them you ain't talked to in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Well, we're getting old now. But anyway, it kind of, today's message kind of goes along with that. I thought if you won the lottery, I wonder how many of them would call you. I wonder how many cousins you would have. Close cousins that you were always their favorite of all the cousins you were always the favorite so I thought this morning if you wasn't here last week we preached on followers the followers of Christ and we seen that there was a crowd of people that would follow him places they were in need of something from him um, I have kids that way that if they need some advice, they call dad. I have children that call dad. I have one I haven't heard from in a month, but he hit a dog last week, messed up his precious car, and he wanted to know, did he need to file it on insurance? And so I said, I don't know. He said, well, I'll take a picture of it. I said, I don't want to take a picture of it. I said, I'll look at it. He said, Dad, it needs to be fixed today. I said, Son, it ain't going to get fixed today. If you had it in the shop, it's going to take a month or two for them to get to it, get it in line and everything else. But, Dad, my car is beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But I want it fixed. So I, the next weekend I looked at it, and it had busted a little piece of plastic on the front. And I said, it's going to cost you, a, I think, a $500 deductible. And I said, you probably could pay for it cheaper than you could do it on your insurance. And plus, my insurance is going to go up because you filed it. And uh, hadn't heard from him since. He'll call me again when he needs something. So the followers, the crowds, would follow Jesus when they were hungry. When they were sick, we see it in our own life when... When some people don't go to church and they don't worship God and they use the language that they want to use and they hang out with the friends they want to hang out with and they drink the beverages they want to drink until their kids get sick. And then they become very religious people. They become very prayerful people. And they, uh, the ones you can't get to answer your phone... All of a sudden, they're calling the preacher three times a day, going, pray, pray, pray for my son. I love God. I love him. I love him. It's kind of like my sister got out of prison. And um, hey, that's a long story. But um, she got out of prison, and she called me, and she told me, she said, Brother, he, she said, I found Jesus this time. And she said, well, she had done found him 20 times before that. But she said, I really found him. I've been in a halfway house and they're, we're doing these Bible studies and I have really found Jesus. And then three days later, she back in jail again. They caught her with something else. And so we, we find these followers that would follow Jesus and they would get what they needed from him and then they'd go away. There's ten lepers that come to Jesus and, and one of them turned back and he said, I thank you for healing me. And he said, what happened to the other ones? Wasn't there ten of you? I don't know. They got what they needed and they went their way. But we also talked about the disciples. 
how the disciples walked with Jesus and he, he saw the miracle. They saw the miracles that Jesus did, but they still argued among themselves about which one of them was his best friend. He's my buddy. He's my pal. And we find that even them, while they were walking with Jesus, were mostly followers. Because you see, you don't come become a disciple and you don't become a best friend until you have skin in the game. There, there's a lot of us that call us their friend until we need something that they got. And I'm not talking about just borrowing their lawnmower. I'm talking about we need them to sign something that, that's putting their whole family at risk. Then you find out who your friends are. A couple of months ago, Somebody put this on Facebook, and God had already started dealing with me about these messages, but it, it really summed it up. I, I couldn't figure out why the disciples, the one following Jesus, were called disciples because they were not very good disciples. And somebody put this on here. A disciple is someone who has moved from being the recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. Let's read that one more time. A disciple is someone who has moved from being the recipient. Man, I, boy, I got a blessing today. Man, that music, that band, it was awesome. And, and, and Brother Mark, or maybe Brother Ricky, Brother, all oh, that message hit me close to home, and buddy, I enjoyed that, and I can't wait to get back, and Lord, I, I've got to go to the food pantry and, and pick up a few things. I need to do this, and I need to do that to get a few things, and the church just offers so many ministries. That's just a blessing to me. Been there? I have. The temperature was just right for me. It was some of them in there was cold, but I man, it was right for me. The volume was just right for me, and they played my favorite song. Oh, it was beautiful. This may be the perfect day. It's when we move from being a recipient of the church's mission to becoming responsible for the church's mission. Jesus met with Peter. And oh, you're not going to like the message, so it's time to tone out if you want to. Jesus asked Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yeah, <laughs> you better believe it. I love you. You're, you're my best friend. You're my buddy. You're my pal. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. So he went from receiving something from God to God asking him to do something. If you love me, do something. And then Jesus, there wasn't another conversation going on. This was the only one coming on. And as soon as Peter got it finished with, I love you, Jesus said, feed my sheep. And Jesus turned around and looked at him and said, Peter, yes, 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 Lord. Do you love me? And Peter said, Well, I done, I done told you that. You know that. I love you. You know I love you. He said, Feed my lambs. Don't you know that in Peter's mind here, where he's thinking, oh, Okay, um, hmm. Do you love me? Do something. Do you love me? Do something. And Peter's like, well, I'm glad I got that over with. And Jesus looked at Peter again and he said, Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter's like, my gosh, why is he asking me three times? I've done, I've done answered this question. I, yes, I love you. I love you. You know I love you, Lord. You know all things from creation until the end of time. You know all things. He said, you know I do. 
Jesus said, would do something. Feed my lambs. We know that Peter also denied even knowing Jesus three times. And then the cock crowed. A lot of Jesus' disciples were, I think, a lot like us sometimes. There's been many a times in my life that I was a follower of Christ because the Spirit made me feel good. God's forgiveness and coming to an altar and and pouring out my brokenness, it it made me feel good about myself. It, it, It made me feel great. It made me feel clean. And I could walk out into the world and if if somebody pinned me down and really asked me, I could say, yes, I'm a Christian. And then they would say, so you go to church every Sunday. And I'm, well, maybe not that kind of Christian. I'm more the twice a year kind of Christian. I'm the kind of, you you can call on me twice, maybe in a year, kind of friend. And then you got the other friends that you may see them every week, but you're really kind of like their sister a little bit. Y'all been there. You had the friend that you was in love with their sister, so you become friends with the brother, or vice versa. And then you had the ones that you would hang out with every once in a while, and you liked them had something in common, but then you had the one that you could call at 2 o'clock in the morning no matter what. The one you could tell your deepest, darkest secrets to. The ones that would poke at you, make fun of you a little bit, but yet you knew without a shadow of a doubt that they loved you and that they would do anything. If you needed to borrow their car to drive to New York, they would say, here's the keys. If you needed the last dime they had in the bank, they would say, meet me at the bank and I'll write you a check. The, the, the kind that would trust their children to you. The kind that would trust their wives to be along with you. The kind that you could go into business with and not have to worry about whether they're stealing from it. The kind that loved you as much as you loved your own self and as much as you loved them. Jesus was asking Peter, if you love me, Do what I ask you to do. Because you see, that kind of friend, there's a cost involved. There is a risk involved. And Peter, as we know, when the risk come to his house, and the woman said, or the young lady said, he's one of Jesus' disciples, what did Peter say? Not, not me, <laughs> you're nuts. I, that's, I got a cousin, man. He looks so much like me. And then another one said, yeah, I think I saw you with him. Me, man, I was in Greece last week. It wasn't me. I've got an alibi. You see, he was afraid it was going to cost him something. And Jesus is looking at Peter and said, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. It's going to cost you something. But Lord, I'm busy. He said, I don't care. If you're going to say that you love me, it's going to cost you something. So we find the same Peter that denied him, that told him that he loved him, and he found out it was going to cost him something. We find this same Peter denying that he even knew him. But in Acts, the Bible said that the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 fell. And the Holy Spirit filled the room and it sat down upon them. It gave them a deeper commitment and a closer tie to God than they ever had before. Because we can't serve Him in the flesh. A lot of Scripture, but I want you to listen to it. This is the same Peter that told God three times that he loved Him. It's also the same Peter that denied he ever knew Him. He didn't deny he was his friend. He said, I don't know this man. Could you imagine your mama saying, he's not my son. He's not my daughter. Hmm. Chapter 2, verse 14, a lot of scripture, but try to stay with us. But Peter, standing up, 
We as Christians have gotten so comfortable with setting down because it's going to cost us something. We, we let the world say anything they want to. We, we let them take prayer out of school. We'll let them take all of these things from us. They'll tell us how we can and can't worship. They'll tell us what churches we can go to. They'll tell us what Bible we can read. They'll tell us anything. We'll just take it laying down. Jesus said, if you love me, do something. So here we find this Peter in a crowd of people that didn't want to hear it. It said, Bible said that Peter standing up with the eleven. So all eleven of them stood up and they lifted up his voice and said unto them. That might not mean a lot to you. But for a man that denied he ever, ever knew Christ to get up from where he's sitting and basically stand up knowing that his life is on the line, knowing that he might embarrass himself, and even knowing that he was a traitor to God because a lot of the Scripture says, and Peter, go tell my disciples, and Peter... He had embarrassed himself. He had made a fool out of himself in front of the other disciples. But the Bible said that Peter stood up and with a loud voice, he brought attention to himself. Basically, he said, listen to me. You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my word. Listen to me. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on the handsmaidens, I will pour out the least of those. I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, and blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and noble day of the Lord to come. And it shall come to pass. Boy, it's getting warm in here. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you men of Israel, you hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God. God said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. He said, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, you've seen all this, which God did himself in the midst of you, as ye you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hand you have crucified and slain whom God had raised up and have loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for it is in my right hand that I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad, and moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. In other words, God hasn't forsaken me because of this man to leave my soul in the grave. He said, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. In other words, he was perfect. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, and thou shalt make me full of the joy with countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak. So now he's going to let loose a little bit. Unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried. They held David so high. He said, David's dead. 
And his bones, he said, his flesh is rotted. He's nothing but bone. And his sepulcher is with us unto the day. And so you still worship him today. He said, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne. <laughs> he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul would not be left in hell, neither his flesh see, did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. We saw it. And therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, receiving of the Father the promise of the Holy, Spirit, Holy Ghost, and he had shown forth this which you now see and hear, for David is not ascended into heavens. But he saith unto him, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, God made him both Lord and Christ. And now, when they heard this, Guess what happened to them? They were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, Oh my God, what are we going to do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this unto, unto word generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. A disciple is someone who has moved from being a recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. I thought of all the the good and bad that Peter gets blamed with. Peter had enough faith that when he realized Jesus was walking on the water that he asked, Lord, if that's you, let me come be where you're at. He wasn't wanting to come to where and walk on the water. He, he was wanting to be who Jesus was. He was wanting to be that man that Jesus was. He wanted to have the power and the strength with God that Jesus was. And Peter said, Lord, let me come. Let me be with you. Let me have what you got. And Jesus, Jesus said, come here. And Peter stepped out on the water and he began to walk. But like we do sometimes, he looked back at the storm he looked back at our reputation. He looked back at what people might think of him. He looked back and thought, well, you know, maybe I'm not worthy of this. Or he looked back and said, what about my fishing crew? What about my livelihood? What about my finances? What about uh, I'm not real uh, bright or I'm not real educated? I'm not really prepared. And the Bible said he turned around and he looked at this storm and immediately he began to sink. This morning we focus on what it is to be a disciple and not to be a follower. A follower follows as long as there's candy. A follower follows as long as there's blessings coming down. I had a, a guy in my home church and I told him, I said, we can't do anything that the Holy Spirit's not leading us to do. And that morning he was a song leader, worship leader. And he sat there on the bench and I looked at my watch and it was five after and I said, Hey Don, it's 
time to start. He said, I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit. We sat there another two or three minutes and preacher's getting antsy. I'm getting antsy. I'm not pastoring. I'm not even a preacher at this time. And the congregation started getting quiet. And, you know, we're rocking on 15 minutes after 11. He said, I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit to move me. So we just kind of sat there and looked at each other like a bunch of idiots looking at one another. And Don got up and he said, the Holy Spirit is not what moves us. He said it's when we come together in one mind and one accord and we start praising God with who we are. He said that God will hear His praises and that He will be in the midst of us. I I thought to myself this morning that church, a disciple is somebody that does what's right and what God would have them to do regardless of what the world thinks about it, regardless of what their friends think about it, regardless about what the church thinks about it. We are the ones that step out on faith and do the work of God regardless. There was many a times that Jesus walked across people that were sick on the Sabbath day and instead of saying, uh, I'll see you in a couple of days, which was against the law, he, He just healed them right where He was at because it was good to do good and bring glory and honor to God whether it was a Sabbath day or not. You see this morning you say, well, they was hanging out with people and the Pharisees said, well, don't he know that he's hanging out with harlots and thieves and tax collectors? I want you to know that Jesus saw that they needed salvation just as much as anybody else needed salvation. That He was willing to hang out with those that were not as up to do as they. He was willing to stand up and read the gospel in the the tabernacle even though he wasn't supposed to. He was willing, thank God, to hit the Pharisees, to hit the Sadducees head on. He was willing uh, to be the man of God that God had called him to do and he didn't have to wait on the Holy Spirit to do it. He done it and the Holy Spirit joined in with him and Peter stood on that day and he said, men and brethren, I'm tired of being quiet. I'm tired of just listening to y'all talk about this man that was an idiot, he was a man of God, approved by God, and filled with God. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. You need to come out of this underworld generation because it's going to lead you to hell. It's going to destroy your communities. It's going to destroy your children. It's going to destroy everything that you hold dear and love. And as long as you sit there with your mouth shut, as long as you sit there thinking, I'm going to wait on the Holy Spirit, the Bible said to know it, to do good, and to do it that not. He said it's a sin. He said everybody that has a breath this morning, let him praise you the Lord. A disciple gets to a point where he doesn't care about the cost. He doesn't care about what song is sung. He don't care about the temperature in the room. He don't care how many shows up for worship or how many it puts what in the offering plate. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve God and whatever y'all do between you and God. But as for me, I'm going to worship Him this morning. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to pray. I'm going to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary and I'm going to love the unlovable. I'm going to embrace the ones that stink so bad. I'm going to feed the hungry, not because I want to, but because God has called me out of being who I want to be into being who He's called me to be. Peter, do you love me? You can't just love me and watch me suffer. You can't love me and say, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that's hungry and I don't like Mexicans and I don't like black people and I don't like poor people and I don't like white people and I, I don't I don't think this is right and I don't think that's right and you know it really don't matter what you think. God's called us if you want to walk on the water, if you want to be to where he's at. There was something in there, something about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Him. He said those that gain their life will lose it, and those that lose their life for my name's sake, He said you'll gain it. 
You see, I, I didn't get into... I still don't make what I was making when I was working in the secular world. And no, I'm not on commission. I took a $60,000 cut in pay to become a preacher. Let that soak in just a minute. I left the house that me and Patsy drew up and had it built lock and key six miles from my family, six miles from her family, and three miles from my best friend. We left the community that I grew up in, that we grew up in, and it's all we knew. Every friend we had, every relative we had was in a ten mile radius. But God said, if you're going to follow me, Every time we've moved, I've watched the tears come out of my family's face. I've watched my wife cry. I've seen my father-in-law go, don't take my grandbabies away from me. And I told Patsy, I said, baby, do what you got to do, but I've got to go where God's sending me to go. If you love me, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. And I love this whole trick. Brother Mark, I don't do any of that. You, you telling me I'm not saved? I'm not telling you anything. It's God's job to judge the hearts of men and women. It's God's job. That's not my job. Maybe just believing on Him and never doing anything about it. Maybe, maybe that, that'll get you into heaven. I don't know. But I do know this. God used to take me in some very uncomfortable places. Very uncomfortable places. And over the years, the uncomfortable places has become the most comfortable I've ever become. Thursday night... When I come here, I didn't necessarily want to be a CR pastor. Mess around with a bunch of recovering drug addicts, people that's been in prison, homeless. That ain't necessarily what I signed up for. Let me tell you what's been going on on Thursday night. And you may or may not be interested in it. I saw 60 people standing in this room listening to the same music, same songs that our band did. The only difference is every one of them was standing up with their arms raised up in the air with tears running down their face. At the end of the service, instead of giving an altar call, we do blue chips. That means you start on something in your life, changing something in your life. Well, just so happened we were out of them. We had one. And I said, I told them tonight, I said, we're not going to do blue chips. I said, but if you need to pray, you couldn't have stuck a sheet of paper and touched the altar Thursday night. Look at this altar. Pretty good size altar. It was from wall to wall with people crying out to God so much and so much to a point that I, even I had to go on with the service and we stood up and done a serenity prayer because they were still praying. If you want to see some worship, come down here on Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Because they ain't got nothing to lose. They don't mind raising up holy hands in the sanctuary. They don't mind. Listen, they'll come and grab me. I sit right there on that end chair and say, Brother Mark, come pray with me. Go pray with them. Somebody will come to the altar and there'll be three wrapped around both sides of them. And they'll get up and they'll hug one another. I thought this morning God's wanting gunners for first. Now I got a hush. I could preach another hour. I got a hush. 
Paul was happy with his life. Saul was happy with his life. But God met him on the road to Damascus and said, what you're doing ain't good enough. He said, you're doing it in my name. He said, but you ain't doing it for me. And Paul walked away a completely different man because Peter stood up and put his life on the line. The Bible said there were 3,000 souls added to the church that day. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe... Let, let, let me do Jesus to Peter. Church, do you love him? That's the question. Do you love him? Yes? Okay, I got another question for you. Do you love him? Do you love him? Three times then do something about it. What has God called you to do? One more thing, they're going to sing. But if you'll notice the Scripture in Peter, or the Scripture in Acts, it said that He, pour, that in the last, he would pour out His Spirit upon the servants, upon the slaves, upon the least of these. He would pour out His Spirit and they would prophesy. They would do something. What's God calling you to do? Appreciate y'all coming the last time to this service. I'll try to tickle your ears next week. Brother Robin Scott's coming to preach for us next Sunday. Him and Lou Ann's going to serve us communion. If you don't know Robin, Robin was a loved, is a loved pastor of this church for years. And God laid it upon my heart. I don't want to give him the pulpit. I like preaching. But this is what God has asked me to do. And he's only preaching the 830 service. Just this one. You can keep it to yourself, or you can do something about it. If you need to pray this morning, Maybe it's time to come from being a follower to becoming a disciple. Stand with us this morning.